Good afternoon, everyone. Will we be uh, breaking it all before we, we, Amanda, would you like me to just begin and go for it? All right. I'm in the unenviable position of being the only thing between you and the reception tonight, so <laughs> go easy. We can stick to the canned questions if you guys would prefer. So uh, I'm Jeff Matson. It's good to see you all. This is my first time to North Dakota. I work for a, a firm, a West Coast-based firm called Ader Wynn. I'm out of the Portland office, and I work mostly in environmental energy and Indian law. Uh, most of my experience on these issues comes out of the Indian law uh, sector, kind of on the NEPA side, mostly uh, economic development activities, gaming, um, some renewable, some coal-fired power plants, things of that nature. Thanks, Amanda. This presentation is kind of an outgrowth of an article that recently appeared in the latest issue of our uh, good friend's journal, the North Dakota Law Review Journal, Volume 88. It was analyzing a, an intersovereign water compact to kind of address a lot of these long, long brewing water resources uh, problems here in this sector of the world. Um, this focuses mostly on the consumption side. There is a whole lot of debate out there on the water quality side. Uh, that lies outside the, the specter of this presentation. So I'm just gonna be talking about allocation and water quantity issues in this presentation. Okay, the agenda. We're gonna talk a little bit about just how much uh, consumption is called for in horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. Uh, the, the groundwater surface water connection uh, impacts the surface water effect groundwater vice versa and impacts to states and tribes. We'll talk a little bit about uh, federal, state and tribal authority over water allocation generally. And um, just on a, on a larger view, there's been a lot of um, just because of the regulatory environment and the core of engineers control over the Missouri main stem, river main stem system, there's a lot of uh, competing issues as far as upper basin states versus lower basin states, primarily in flood control and navigation, but also in irrigation. And we're talk we'll talk a little bit about Indian Reserve water rights. And we'll talk about some of the emerging uh, developments to include um, the water supply agreements that are the core is starting to ink just recently. Intense consumption. The, uh, you can see the figures there. The US EPA estimates between 2.3 and 3.8 million gallons per well uh, of water is needed. And that's from kind of start to finish. Most of the uh, water um, is used in one cycle. However, we're seeing in, in Appalachia, the use of uh, two cycles of water, sometimes three cycles of water with the cement, the mud, and um, with on-site uh, water treatment. Out here, the State Water Commission estimates one to 1.5 uh, million gallons per well in the Bakken Formation. And in comparison, if you look at coal, ba coal bed methane uh, water intensity, you know, a, a, tight, a tightly compacted shale formation like the Bakken really requires lots more than coal bed methane production and other oil and gas extraction activities. Um, you guys have may, 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 may have seen this figure before, but through 2019, the State Water Commission estimates that probably 51,000 acre feet uh, of water may be used out here in this particular formation. We know that um, we are starting to exhaust some uh, aquifers. Mostly groundwater is being tapped due to some issues that we'll talk about a little bit further, but we are overdrawing certain aquifers faster than they are being recharged. And that's, uh, that's a, a pretty scary situation if you're relying exclusively on groundwater and the cost to truck and ship water to these sites, to these wells, is, is rising uh, day in and day out. Pressure head declines of one to two feet per year. Uh, that's uh, expected to actually increase over time. The collateral demands, in addition to just the wells themselves, many of you are familiar with the, the man camps out there in, in Western Dakota. Uh, the man camps, also the families, and uh, you know, the increased infrastructure that's being developed out there apartment complexes, city services. There's intense water consumption both at the f on the fields as well as in the towns and rural communities. And those needs are gonna be increasing as well as the infrastructure starts to be improved upon and you're seeing more municipal, uh, uh, more, uh, municipal water supplies being put into use. The character of use uh, at the well fields themselves, this is a character of use that's unlike agriculture or irrigation where sometimes you can have successive uses of the water Oftentimes, based on the chemical constituents in the fracking fluids, 
you can't recycle them to a degree where they they can be used for groundwater or for drinking water. I'm sorry, for drinking water purposes down the down the um, down the road. Also, when you're taking water and putting it into a well, oftentimes you're having to uh, re-inject it just to d just to um, get rid of it. It's not flowing back to, for for example, the Missouri River system to be uh, used for other industrial purposes like heating and cooling of industrial plants. Just uh, kind of a survey of what's going on in different regions, uh, specifically with oil and gas development in Texas with respect to the drought that they've been experiencing for a couple years now. It prompted uh, the water agencies to reconsider the sales to the natural gas uh, companies. Uh, some of the prices there I think are astounding. $9,500 to $17,000 per million gallons of water. That's, uh, if you're a farmer, you could make a, a pretty sweet killing on that. <laughs> In Colorado, companies uh, successfully bid for the first time just last year on water that was uh, not yet allocated, uh, that had been uh, historically claimed by farmers. And then you have the, uh, pub the public at large going, goodness, is this really a good thing we want where oil and gas development is, is uh, contrasting sharply with the needs in the agricultural sector. In Pennsylvania, this is an interesting model, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission. It's uh, a river basin commission that has authority to manage all of the waters in the Susquehanna and the tributaries. And they actually uh, temporarily susp suspended some natural gas withdrawal permits. And that was kind of the first time a, uh, a regulatory body just basically suspended, said, sorry, the river, level, river levels are too low. And what's interesting is Pennsylvania, it's a riparian state uh, with respect to water law. It's a ton of water out there usually, but again, the hydraulic fracturing uh, consumptive use is so intense out there, even in water-rich states, they're feeling the brunt of this, of these competing uses. I won't get into kind of the, uh, the engineering or the hydrogeology, but we know that when you extract surface water, it can reduce the water table such that ground water, uh, water tables are, are affected. You'll see a, a corresponding decrease in the elevation of your, of your well. Uh, conversely, you know, if you're pulling out too much groundwater, it's gonna it's gonna pull down your surface water stores in um, your uh, your water courses. So we're gonna transition from the consumption uh, area to impacts to states and tribes, just generally. How many of you are familiar with the Flood Control Act of 1944? Anyone? Anyone? A couple. Okay. So the Army Corps of Engineers is in charge of the, the main stem system, uh, the six main reservoirs here on the Missouri River. And unfortunately, this archaic Flood Control Act of 1944 established eight competing uses, all the way from navigation and flood control, these dominant uses down to the secondary uses, fish and wildlife, recreation, um, water supply generally for muni municipal uses. And the Corps of Engineers, while it doesn't own the water rights themselves, it manages the storage at the storage at the reservoirs. And by managing the storage in the reservoirs, they're kind of a de facto river, they're a de facto river manager, a river master. And so the road to water in this area, the, in this neck of the woods of the country, goes through the Corps of Engineers. Um, some of those uh, enumerated purposes are outlined on that slide. The Flood Control Act of 1944 was amended uh, several years later by the o Omahone um, Milliken Amendment. And what this did was it, it, it highlights the, um, the two different shades in the Missouri River Basin you have, the prior appropriative, prior appropriative drier, arid, upper basin states and the more riparian, more humid, lower basin states. And it said that for those um, consumptive uses like irrigation, um, those will be uh, weighed in, uh, at a higher, higher level than navigation and uh, some other downstream uses. Um, as a practical matter, in my research for this article, navigation in the Missouri River down the lower uh, reaches towards St. Louis is just a fraction of what it used to be in the 80s. Most of the navigation, so when you guys see the news reports about how the nav industry is up in arms as far as um, the core, you know, keeping water, uh, or releasing water for flood control, uh, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of a false argument. It's, it's a red herring. Uh, the nav industry, most of it is sand and gravel, and the, the bulk of the sand and gravel, even though by volume it's pretty, pretty impressive, it's only being processed about a quarter mile to a half mile away from where it's being extracted in the riverbed. So navigation really isn't that big of a, uh, it's a paper tiger right now. State authority. 
The, a few years ago, this, I think this case in reoperation of the system, um, this was a case where North Dakota has a real vibrant recreation and sport fishing industry. And the Corps, in meeting its obligations under the Endangered Species Act, has to release a certain amount of uh, water every year to support um, the habitat needs, critical habitat designations for three, uh, for three specific species, uh, the piping plover, the least tern, and the pallid sturgeon. And so um, oftentimes the, the needs of the Corps to release water for those uses um, gets, you know, uh, it's, it's adverse to some of the more upstream uses. This duty to balance um, these uses, uses was drawn really uh, was 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 debated in this in this case, where the Eighth Circuit basically said that North Dakota is preempted from exercising or enforcing its state water quality standards against the Corps of Engineers, um, the Corps of Engineers' authority under the Federal uh, Flood Control Act of 1944 uh, is is uh, takes primacy and releasing water for fish and wildlife for navigation supersedes that of North Dakota and water, water, state water quality standards. Uh, another issue that's you know, a long, long time brewing, uh, the state uh, water, uh, a water commission here in North Dakota and the state engineer has eloquently uh, argued and articulated this point that, well, as a prior appropriative state here in North Dakota, by your very own constitution, the state owns the waters. Um, in the navigable Missouri River. And before the system, before the Corps of Engineers and the federal government and Congress said, we want to put this you know, amazing, you know, very large public works pro uh, project in here, North Dakota had a very solid right to the water that the natural flow through this Missouri River before the Corps of Engineers uh, put the project in. So this is, this is what's really uh, kind of a, a, bone, uh, a bone of contention between the state of North Dakota and the Corps of Engineers. When different oil and, um, oil and gas developers want access to the surface waters, the abundant surface waters of the Missouri River system, they have to go get their easement um, or a license to access cross federal land to stick their straw in the reservoir to pull water out. And um, North Dakota was saying basically, hey, that's, that's our water. We don't care if it's been backed up in a huge reservoir in Lake Sac. There's a certain amount of water in there at the very, you know, at the very bottom of the bowl, if you will. That's North Dakota water. So this is a longstanding issue. I think uh, another another interest interesting issue that's getting a little bit more airtime now in the uh, Clean Air Act realm and climate change is the public trust doctrine. North Dakota is one of the one of uh, a minority of states, much like Hawaii, uh, Oregon, Washington State, that have articulated a public trust duty on the part of the state to manage its water resources and other public trust resources for the betterment of, it, of the public. So what that does is the state engineer and the water commission has to engage in a planning process before, um, before basically entering into contracts that are gonna draw down those important public trust re resources. Uh, that, you know, when you have low water times, uh, droughts, low snowfall periods, those, um, that balancing and planning, it's, it's pretty tricky. Uh, some of those uses, the public trust uses that have been articulated by the North Dakota Supreme Court include swimming and recreation, fishing, as well as irrigation. So again, kind of goes to that balancing act. A little bit more about the uh, comprehensive state plan and the uh, issuing the water permits. So that public trust doctrine is important in each one of those permit issuan issuing decisions. Moving um, on to tribal authority. Now, some of you are probably familiar with kind of the, the Montana decision and its progeny. And as separate sovereigns, the tribes in the Missouri River Basin have uh, reg regulatory control over the water resources within their boundaries. Um, the EPA treats tribes as states for most of its major pollution control programs and its environmental statutes, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, RICRA, CERCLA, you name it. So. Tribes are an important part of this discussion, uh, not to mention, you know, on, on Fort Berthold, we have, you know, in a nor it's sitting right above the Bakken Formation, and um, the three affiliated tribes are, as I understand it, are presently moving forward with plans to open a refinery, a processing plant on the reservation itself. So tribes, even some of those ones that are more further extended, the Rocky Boy uh, Reservation, et cetera, 
that are further away from the main stem, tribes are a part of the conversation, um, and, 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 and their authority over, over water resources lends more to that kind of uncertainty. This supply uncertainty uh, is also exacerbated by the effects of climate change. And I think what's, what's interesting is the, with respect to the increased fluctuation of these dry wet periods, going back doing the research, that 1993 flood that was especially felt along the Mississippi River Basin where you know, barges of goods were stranded for days and weeks uh, basically followed the 19, 1988 drought. Uh, as we saw, the 2011 500 year flood event on the Missouri River Granted, it wasn't felt that much by North Dakota. The, the severity of the flood was more, long, more felt along the, lo uh, the lower reaches in Iowa and Missouri. But we're already kind of in another drought period. So these big flood events, I think, draw our attention away from this new climatological normal where we're seeing uh, just the, the vacillating amounts of water that are in the system. On any in any given year, one thing that you know, th one of the main reasons why um, the Bureau of Reclamation, the Army Corps of Engineers, came together with the 1944 Flood Act um, is there was this there was this idea that there's so much irrigable land in the basin that you know at some point we're going to get our act together and we're going to start farming it. You know that really hasn't happened to the degree that the planners originally intended. That's not to say it still won't happen. Uh, pipeline networks are being uh, built and the infrastructure is improving, so one day we may see more agricultural use. Uh, about three or four years ago, before the oil and gas boom really, it really started picking up steam, you know, we had President Bush at his uh, State of the Union address talking about switchgrass and biomass production and how, you know, we're, we're going to have a, a, a fuel uh, energy policy that, you know, is, is, is going to include switchgrass. Much of that switchgrass is going to be uh, planted along the Missouri River Basin. So while biomass and biofuels have kind of taken a, a secondary position to uh, oil and gas, and especially the natural gas boom, uh, it still is there and um, will be probably developed in the future. And just these figures are, are, are interesting. The, 30 f the Missouri River Basin is responsible for 46% of the wheat, 34% of the cattle, and 22% of the corn grown in the U.S. So what basically what that boils down to is the Corps of Engineers' responsibility for managing that system for especially flood control, um, it's important because uh, a lot of that fertile cropland and farmland is down there along the um, the lower along the uh, the river basin itself that has a propensity to flood. So continuing on with the supply uncertainty, the Indian Reserve water rights that we um, I mentioned earlier, these numbers are a little bit old. Um, the 8.6 million acre feet per year, that's um, kind of the total outstanding. The Minnesota uh, water resource water uh, Water Rights Alliance. It's a uh, was a predecessor organization to the Great Plains Tribal uh, Alliance uh, for water for uh, for reserved water rights. They estimated this is probably mid 90s, 8.6 million acre feet. The Corps of Engineers used that value as a planning value when it rewrote its uh, master manual for operating the main stem main stem system. And just the total flow at St. Louis, where the Missouri River connects up with the Mississippi River. There's that total flow of 57 million acre feet. So that 8.6, if it was ever put to beneficial use, could cut into uh, and frustrate many of the many of the uh, existing uses. Water marketing, it seems like it's less of an issue these days, but at times, different tribes and private entities have um, uh, tried to uh, gil, uh, tried to enter into agreements to market and sell water via pipeline out of the Missouri River Basin north. Um, and into the Hudson River Basin. And that, of course, frustrates downstream uses. So I think we can kind of skip over this slide. Um, it's just basically navigation and flood control are the top primary uses, and we have those secondary uses like fish and wildlife and recreation on the, on the river. So just uh, from an engineering standpoint, the, uh, the way that the Missouri River system functions, if you imagine a, a uh, each one of the six main stem reservoirs, the Corps of Engineers has to evacuate a certain amount of water each fall prior uh, through the winter before things ice up to accommodate the uh, slam of rain uh, of runoff in the spring, the spring run, if you will, of runoff. And if you don't have enough capacity in those reservoirs to uh, to hold that runoff, 
what happens is you, you saw the effects of the uh, 2011 flood where, you know, record releases at Gavin's Point um, are, you know, it was just, it was a very severe flood event. So it's this balancing act. And when we talk about reserved water rights, how much water the Corps of Engineers needs to retain in each reservoir pool um, to protect those reserved water rights, whether or not they're in play or being used or exercised or put to beneficial use, um, it does affect the ability of each reservoir to function as a uh, flood storage. So kind of moving into more just the uh, impacts to states. The, uh, using North Dakota as a, as a case study, the industrial use is listed as fifth in priority after domestic, municipal, livestock, and irrigation. Um, kind of a historical focus on agricultural use. And so in this boom time that we're all living in, when the need is strong to, um, to find water for industrial use, oil and gas development constitutes an industrial use, it's tough to convert existing permits uh, to a lower priority use. There is an exception in North Dakota um, uh, Century Code to uh, do temporary in lieu uh, permits, whereby you could have an existing permit for uh, an ag agricultural use, and that could be uh, flipped over for a temporary period to industrial use. So impacts to tribe, tribes. You know, so oil and gas development, some tribes are, are kind of jumping into oil and development, um, oil and gas development especially, three affiliated tribes. And it's, it's, a great, it's a great economic development tool. It contributes to tribal sovereignty and uh, services and programs on the reservation. Uh, definitely supports a self-determination policy that's been in place since the 80s. But, you know, with a, spe special respect, with a special respect to the water quality discussion, tribes are still concerned because with the potential for well casings to breach and the contamination into groundwater aquifers, some tribes are still a little bit leery about bringing in um, or entering into leases on their reservations, some reservations. Of, you know, of special import, most of these tribes, um, much like most rural communities in South Dakota, North Dakota, and Eastern Montana, rely exclusively on groundwater sources for their municipal and domestic water uses. And so that kind of, you know, fuels the fire of those concerned about the water quality, the specter of well casing breaches and contamination to groundwater. So as the technologies improve, um, is anyone fit here familiar with the, uh, the processing or refining facility that's gonna go in at Fort Bertold? Is anyone familiar with that? Um, I think it's supposed to go online 2013, end of 2013, so that'll be, uh, that'll be uh, very helpful for those, uh, those recoveries. So Indian Reserve water rights, I think uh, it bears, mention, men, bears mentioning, the, they're present perfected, so as distinguished from state water rights, they don't need to be put to uh, beneficial use to be certified under state law. Uh, that's why they're so concerning, they lend themselves to so much uncertainty because even if they haven't been quantified yet through a general stream adjudication or a settlement between the state and the tribe, they're still just kind of out there hovering, stymieing development. The quantification, um, you know, it's, it's, it would probably, you know, this is just my opinion that quantification, where I've seen it done, especially Montana, is leaning forward with water rights settlements between the state and different tribes. It does seem to add a level of certainty for what these developed uses. Uh, especially when you, when, you, when you get into a boom time situation of oil and gas development. Everyone, every single one of the players knows exactly how much water is committed to each of the sovereigns and they can make up their minds about what, how they want to use that water and develop it. Um, the quantification discussion gets a little bit trickier uh, if you look at tribe to tribe. Some of the tribes, especially um, those in South Dakota, see quantification as almost a concession to the federal government or state government uh, that they have, uh, they're, they're conceding rights to le uh, the water as well as land because of a historical interconnectedness between land and water. So hesitanc hesitancy to uh, quantify there. And then as a snapshot in time, what's, what's a little bit interesting is if you quantify now, will you be quantifying the appropriate amount of water for future use, future development on the reservation. That's another concern that, that tribes have. And then finally, even if, let's say, perfect world, 
uh, all existing Indian Reserve water rights were quantified, it still doesn't entitle tribes or states for that matter of a specific amount of allocation at in each core reservoir. So uh, the core can enter into um, contracts and um, with different entities for a right of storage, but quantifi quantification does not mean that each reservoir will have a certain 10% allowance for a particular constituency or sovereign nation. Uh, another level of, a, of uncertainty out there that I think it bears mentioning is that there's kind of a un, unsolved question uh, with respect to whether Indian reserve rights apply to groundwater sources. The courts are trending in the direction that Indian reserve water rights apply also to groundwater sources as well. There's a um, Arizona Supreme Court decision, one of the Gila River uh, litigation. There's also a um, high court decision in Montana and there's uh, a vacated, well, it was published, but it was later vacated due to settlement of a Western District uh, federal court decision out of Washington State that says regardless of where the water's coming from, whether it's a groundwater, aquifer, or surface water, the, according to the Winters Doctrine, which is the basis for these reserved water rights, um, to fulfill the primary purpose of the reservation, the tribes can reach for the water through groundwater or surface water supplies. It's still up in the air whether the Eighth Circuit and different state courts within the Missouri River Basin will take that as persuasive or, or just a, a good idea. So we're kind of at the point in the presentation as a way forward. What's, what's, what's happening and what, what, where's, the, uh, where's the way? How will states uh, and different entities, tribes, access specifically Missouri River system water? Um, the good news is that the core is undertaking different studies um, in support of surplus water determinations at each of the six uh, main reservoirs in the Missouri River system. And I threw up here uh, litigation possibly between some of the basin states and the United States government. Not to say the Corps has been dragging their feet, but it's been very difficult to find the, the, per, the, the exact authority under the Flood Control Act of 1944 or perhaps the water um, uh, the Water Resources Act of 1958 as to how the Corps can go about entering into these either short-term or long-term water supply contracts. And so what they're doing is, what the Corps is doing is under, under um, the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, they are undertaking um, a study. The first one at Lake Sac resulted in a finding of no significant, uh, uh, a FONSI finding of no significant impact. Thank you. Um, for the Lake Sac withdrawal. So every time the Corps enters into even a short term, even if it's only a five year water supply agreement, it's beholden to, um, uh, to, to go through a NEPA process and do the NEPA analysis. So the interstate, I threw down there, threw up there on the slide, the interstate or intersovereign water compact. Because of the success in primarily riparian, more humid environs, uh, water commissions, the Susquehanna River Basin Commission and the Delaware River Basin Commission in managing an entire basin water source, it seems um, like a viable, um, it seems like a viable management solution, even in the Missouri River Basin. I hear some giggles up there, so I'm, I'll welcome your questions. Uh, the final surplus water report for Garrison Dam and Lake Sac, this, this always fr frustrates me, 100,000 acre feet per year. If you go to the store, you buy any, uh, any good, and it's being sold for a flat 100,000, doesn't that pique your interest a little bit that what type of uh, <laughs> engineering went into coming up with that figure? 10 years, 100,000, we know it's there. But that is the figure that the Assistant Secretary of the Army um, came up with as far as the amount of surplus water available for municipal and industrial, uh, i.e. oil and gas development water use for Lake Sac, and Lake Sac being the biggest um, the biggest reservoir in the main sim system and, cl and closest to the Bakken formation. This, uh, these surplus water agreements, they're capped out at five years. And what's pretty amazing is, so the Corps is undertaking a, a nationwide pricing policy to uh, establish what should be a fair price in uh, basically entering into these contracts for water supply. And right now, until they lock down through you know formal notice and comment rulemaking, the price to that price for that water is, is at no charge. It's basically free for right now until that pricing policy goes into effect. And 
the, the, the specter of easements uh, for access and licenses to cross the federal land to even stick your straw into a reservoir to pull out and access water, to extract water, is still ever present and must be dealt with. The uh, first surplus water agreement was just inked uh, this winter on September, or I'm sorry, on December, I think it was December 31st, right around Christmas time, the Northwestern Division and the Assistant Secretary of the Army uh, approved this contract and it went into effect on February 6, 2013. It's the first of its kind. It, this agreement's gonna allow International Western of South Lake, Texas to withdraw surplus water for use in the Bakken Formation. I think this site, with the actual withdrawal site, is going to be pretty close to Williston, if I'm not mistaken. The next, um, so that's going to be the first of its kind, and there's, you know, hundreds of these water supply contract applications in the queue. The Corps is processing them on a first and uh, a fir you know first in time, first in review uh, process, but it's going to take you know over the next couple years to to finish the review process and enter entering into them, these short term. So long-term contracts, municipalities, especially in Western North Dakota, as well as oil and gas developers are interested in, in entering into longer term, 15, 20, permanent uh, long-term contracts for water supply agreements. And the only authority for the Corps to enter into these agreements is under the water supply, or excuse me, the water, the water supply act of 1958. So right now it's, uh, I think it's, issued draft reports on five, perhaps all six of the, the, the basins for these short-term water supply um, agreements. And it's still working on a larger, all-encompassing reallocation study, uh, which will probably require an actual EIS and not just a environmental assessment, you know, FONSI. So this EIS and the larger reallocation study to see if there's enough water available at the reservoirs for municipal and industrial uses over 15 and 20 year time, time periods is, is ongoing. And that'll be a uh, great use and will contribute to certainty. Okay, that uh, wraps up my presentation. I'd love to uh, answer some of your questions. And the canned questions are okay. I guess I'll get us started. Uh, in an, your opinion, what is the likelihood that if tribes were excluded from water negotiations and that uh, subsequently were held to follow those results of the negotiations. Would courts view uh, this as a taking under the Fifth Amendment? So kind of putting aside the takings, uh, the take potential takings claim under the Fifth Amendment, the, so the vested, the vested right, and given that the Indian Reserve water rights are, are present perfected, there's still too much ambiguity without the quantification to, I think if you look at your bundle of sticks, the reserved water rights becomes more bona fide for lack of, for real lack of a better um, legal term of art, becomes more bona fide after it's been quantified. And still this, this, this time frame where we're, where we're at where the Indian reserved water rights are not yet quantified, it would be, you'd be hard pressed so number one, I think establish injury and, and, and put a, you know, a dollar amount on damages on exactly what, what was taken um, when the reserved water right is, is not yet quantified. But again, like uh, the pr uh, speaker before me, I didn't really study that question. The water in the lake is owned by the state of North Dakota and that to draw it first a, a permit from the state is required and then a permit to cross the Corps of Engineers land to actually get to it and access it. So I can't speak to the ownership. I think the Corps of Engineers would still, and I, and again, I need to clarify, I, I worked with the Corps of Engineers during law school, but I was never a Corps, employ, a Corps employee. I do not speak on behalf of the Department of Defense or the U.S. Army. But I would, I would go out on a limb and, and suggest that North Dakota, North Dakota has pretty good title to m most of the water that's in that reservoir. I, I would I would I would go that far. However, as far as the the the, seek, the, um, the temporally, which permit is required first? That is, I I'm not sure how the Corps is currently doing that. Um, I know for the free stretches of the river, 
for certain, you would have to go, so above, um, above Lake Sac, you would have to go through the Water Commission State Engineer, get your permit, but for the reservoir, um, I don't know if the state permit is a necessary prerequisite before you can start entering into negotiating for an easement to cross the federal land for a reservoir. So from a, from a physical perspective, you have reservoirs, which are, you know, like with most of the river, is, is kind of held under this navigation servitude you could think of. And so, but those free range stretches between the reservoirs, I think the state of North Dakota is, a, is in a much stronger position to assert its permitting authority before um, pulling water out, if that answers your question. That was kind of a tap dancing answer. Hi, I do have a question. Um, yeah, shoot. Interested to see if you have a perspective as far as the Eighth Circuit case law, either district court level or court of appeal, with regard to preemption in this, this general area of water resource. Just a, have you seen any patterns or anything that in terms of whether they'll be taking a broad view of preemption or a, a more narrow view? Mm. You know, th the Eighth Circuit hasn't really articulated, especially with respect to federal law, if I understand you right, the correction of federal preemption over state law. Right. Um, I think it came up the most in the NRA um, operation of the Missouri River Main Stem System case. Right. Uh, I don't think the court used the word preemption specifically in asserting that either due to field um, uh, or of the, of the three different kinds of preemption right. that it, um, it, it took over that water quality, that state water quality standard. But, you know, maybe you could draw a lot out of the dicta of that case that in effect that's what the Eighth Circuit articulated back in the early 90s when it, when it decided that case. Since then, um, I haven't seen any of the lower courts in the, in the circuit or the Eighth Circuit touch upon, uh, upon that question. Um, with respect to not to, not to, um, not to throw out the inter-sovereign compact as a, uh, not to try to hard sell it on you guys, but um, it is interesting in that, you know, it takes federal legislation to get rid of the, to supersede the Flood Control Act of 1944. And, um, I, I just would like to see some federal legislation on the matter just to, for once and for all, really directly a frontal attack of the Flood Control Act of 1944 because that's really standing in the way of a lot of, um, uh, a lot of forward progress on this issue. I have a question. Uh-oh. Um, <laughs> once a compact is reached, what do you think the primary responsibility of enforcement should be? So, um, or who do you think should have the responsibility for enforcement? So in, in the article, I, I, th I, th I thought that might be a, there might be a good solution or a good model in this, uh, I think it was the Three Sovereigns, the Three Sovereigns organization out in uh, the Columbia River Basin. So where I hail from in the very swampy, wet Pacific Northwest and in dealing with the different uses, uh, the Columbia River Basin, hy hydroelectric power, uh, fisheries management. We have some uh, some of our own competing uses. The Three Sovereigns Initiative kind of established a quasi decision-making body for both enforcement, planning, and regulation purposes. And each one of the sovereigns, states, tribes, the federal government, had equal voting power. And only by a decision of this um, this body, similar to a commission, um, could it enforce. And so the who of your question. I would like to see it more of a collective body, a regulatory body, such as a, a river basin commission. So it wouldn't be, uh, it wouldn't be any specific sovereign or individual or chair or member or specific committee. It would be the um, executory commission of that regulatory agency. Hi, Mr. Matson. You know, I'm just thinking about the tribes in North Dakota and what they could do in order to ensure that their tribal sovereignty is protected because I know you mentioned the inter-sovereign approach, but historically, tribes have always been so at somewhat of a disproportionate bargaining power right. in that scenario. So I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, sure. So, you know, in this day and age, I think one of the, one of the most effective ways to protect tribal sovereignty is frankly through economic development uh, in assisting self the self-determination policy on each reservation. So with that said, I think ways to prevent the chipping away of, of sovereignty is to both through economic development and 
each of the tribes, especially North Dakota, I think the three affiliated tribes have done a good job in, in fact, they're currently working on uh, a regulatory regime to regulate fracking on the Fort Berthold Reservation. And so through economic development initiatives, like you know going through and leasing uh, different areas of the reservation for oil and gas, other economic uh, development initiatives, whether it be energy production, other private, I'm no, sorry, tribal corporations, the, that economic development and also the, the assertion of regulatory jurisdiction, civil and criminal, is, is the, be the two most important means to protect existing tribal sovereignty and protect it from being chipped away. I think if you take fracking as, as an example, what better way to protect tribal sovereignty than asserting the, the, the tribe's natural resources department and promulgating its own regulations for water quality, for um, you know just what the, the, the water treatment options are on the reservation. So they kind of go hand in hand, the economic development as an engine for self-determination, but then also the tribes regulating their sovereign area. Thank you very much. Thank you.